Hello and welcome to Highland Country Fellowship. We're really glad you're here. Happy Memorial Day weekend. Uh, I'm glad on this weekend, a lot of people have things to do. I'm glad so many of you are here. Uh, so if we have not yet met, my name is Bill Rector. I am delighted to be the teaching pastor. I'm glad Kyle's delighted that I'm the teaching pastor too. Um, uh, if I wasn't here last week, some of the, the duties and responsibilities I have at the school where I serve uh, gave me no time at all to prepare, but it was fun to be here and sit in the back. Uh, and I should have worn some dark glasses and just hid there, but uh, what a great job. I know Kyle would want all the glory to God, but what a great job you did. Uh, and it is a little too good, actually. So uh, I rush back into the thing here. Uh, either way, whether it's Kyle, me, or if we ever, God forbid, have Sammy teach, uh, we would... Oh, no, it'd be fun. It's what Sammy teaches. It's like watching the blind discus thrower at a track meet. Uh, he may not win anything, but everybody's paying attention to every, every minute of that. Uh, but one of our values here, whoever is teaching, is that we go verse by verse through God's Word because if I thought I was ever so arrogant to have any of my own ideas that were better for you than those God breathed and wrote down 2,000 years ago, kick me, okay? I would say shoot me, but I know we got armed people in here, so just, <laughs> let's just leave it at kick me. Today we begin the 11th chapter in Luke's gospel. We went through chapter 10 so fast, I still pulled a muscle from doing it. So, uh, but the 11th chapter, and uh, you know, Kyle mentioned this, and it, it really is obvious if you studied Luke's gospel, and Luke tells us right from the get-go, he says, I'm going to present an orderly account, and that word doesn't mean he's going to give it to us in order, like by date. It's going to be more like sorted by subject. And so there's an order to what he's doing, and every now and then it really comes out why. And today's going to be one of those days uh, as we get to see that progression. But uh, before we do, let's just let's open God's Word right now. We're in uh, uh, Luke chapter 11, and we'll start here with verse, might as well start with verse 1. One day when Jesus was praying in a certain place, when he finished, one of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray, just as John taught his disciples. He said to them, when you pray, say, Father, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Give us each day our daily bread. Forgive us our sins, for we also forgive everyone who sins against us. And lead us not into temptation. Then he said to them, suppose one of you has a friend and he goes to him at midnight and says, friend, lend me three loaves of bread because a friend of mine on a journey has come to me and I have nothing to set before him. Then the one inside answers, don't bother me. The door's already locked. My children are in my bed with me. I can't get up and give you anything. I tell you, though he will not get up and give him the bread because he is his friend, yet because of the man's boldness, he will get up and give him as much as he needs. So I say to you, ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and the door will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives. He who seeks finds, and to him who knocks, the door will be opened. Which of you fathers, if your son asks for a fish, will give him a snake instead? Or if he asks for an egg, will give him a scorpion? If you then, though you are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children... How much more will your Father in heaven give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? And this, beloved, is the word of the Lord, and the mouth of the Lord has spoken it. There's a lot there. And just to be truthful in advertising, I don't think I'm going to be able to get through all 13 of those verses today, because there's a lot of fun stuff there. But I hope the beginning part was at least sounded familiar to you as the Lord's Prayer. But if you're like me, there's a few words missing from that Lord's Prayer, at least the one that I memorized. And, and, and that's kind of interesting, so let's begin right there. And that is, there, there, there are two versions of the Lord's Prayer given in the Gospels. And one is in this one here, in Luke chapter 11. And then there's another one that's right in the middle of the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew chapter 6. And it's a little bit longer, 
And it's probably the one that we're most familiar with, the one that, that we recite. And we've spoken about this before, that if you were wanting to reach a lot of people today, you might just publish a book. Publishing a book is easier now than it has ever been in human history, right? Uh, that, don't get any ideas, right? But it, it, it is easy to do. It's also easy to have a podcast or a blog, and your ideas can reach lots of people. But think first century now. Writing and writing implements are, are rare. I mean, it was done, obviously, right? But most often they relied on this oral tradition in their society. So a speaker, a teacher, would travel around from place to place and likely say the same phrases over and over again. Please remember that if you get ever tired of one of my jokes, right? It's just, it's the way that would work. We just, I don't know how many times I've told you my, what my grandpa said that, it, you know, sitting in a church won't make you a Christian any more than sitting in a chicken house will make you a chicken, right? So that's because of that oral tradition that I come from, right? So this is the same, I think, with the Sermon on the Mount. I think Jesus taught these ideas many times as he went from place to place. And yet there was one famous time when he did that on a hillside near the Sea of Galilee. I'll give you an example. I don't want to beat this to death, but uh, Dr. Martin Luther King gave a famous speech. Almost all of us know it or know part of it. It's called the I Have a Dream speech, right? And there's an actual time and date that people associate with that. It's August of 1963 and something called the March on Washington in front of the Lincoln Memorial. But that speech, parts of it were actually given for three years prior to that as he traveled around the country. So these were ideas that he spoke about very often and most famously at that one occasion. Same thing, I believe, with the Sermon on the Mount. And that would make sense, I hope. So because of this, when we hear the ideas from the Sermon on the Mount and we find them elsewhere in the Bible, it could be, and it's likely here, that it was on another occasion when Jesus was teaching the same thing. By the way, just a quick plug as an aside, Joanna's going to begin beginning a series, uh, a class series. We have at 9 o'clock, we have some Sunday school classes. She's beginning one for the summer about the Sermon on the Mount and the path of discipleship that's, that's launched in it. it. I've read the outline of it this week. It looks amazing. I encourage you to consider it. So Matthew's account was that one famous time. Luke's account here sounds different to us. It sounds like Jesus is responding to maybe one of his disciples. It might have been maybe more intimate, maybe a smaller group of people. Does that make sense? But in addition to the different occasions, and ones in Luke and ones in Matthew, I remember learning it in the old King James Version. So I actually worked real hard on these slides here. Let's see if we can compare these two versions and you'll see kind of the way it goes. Uh, the familiar version, the King James Version of Matthew 6, after this manner, therefore pray ye. Does that sound like King James Version or what? Right? Our Father which art in heaven. Okay. Well. Luke's version is different. He just said, he said to them, when you pray, say, Father. Right? Okay, next. Hallowed be thy name, followed by hallowed be your name. 400 years of translation, pretty much the same thing there, right? The King James Version was published in 1611. Uh, Sammy reminded me of that. I'm not, don't ask me why he knows, Okay. But it was uh, 1611 was when that was published. There are a lot of people that really put a lot of stake in that King James edition. It's probably more because it's, it's more traditional. Uh, honestly, I, I don't want to get into a fight over that. I, I think the, the King James was an English translation of a Latin version of the Bible, which was a translation of a Greek of many things that were spoken in Aramaic and Hebrew. So I, I don't want to get into a fuss over... Language is important. I don't want to fight over it. But the gospel has been translated into hundreds of languages and brought so many to faith that I'm committed to the idea that the ideas behind it are of God and transformative. Amen? So I want you to think about that a little bit. And you can see there's not much difference here. Then the, the thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. That's a beautiful thing. Luke just gives us the your kingdom come version. That's actually, that's what Jesus said at that time. Same concept, isn't it? Your kingdom is coming. We acknowledge you are going to reign. You are going to be in charge. And uh, we want to align ourselves with that. That's, that's really what's going on. I really do like the idea 
of recognizing, though, that we, we want that to be on earth as it is in heaven. That's, I kind of miss that part of that, just myself, right? And then next, again, give us this day our daily bread. Give us each day our daily bread. 400 years of English scholarship, and we change uh, this to each. It's good with me, okay? Uh, forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Forgive us our sins, for we also forgive everyone who sins against us. Now, this is something we may not get to today, but this is interesting. I don't know if you've, I don't know if you realize when you pray that, pray that you're asking God to forgive you in the same measure that you forgive others. And, and I don't, I don't want that. I want God to forgive me like God. I don't want God to forgive me like me, because I'm, I'm a patient in this hospital, and I'm not always the most forgiving. Amen. But this, this reminds us not only that God forgives us, but that we need to forgive in the same measure. Amen? <laughs> and then finally, and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. That's the one I grew up reciting, and many of you probably did the same. And this one just simply truncates. It just says, and lead us not into temptation. So... What's really interesting about this to me is there are six basic things that are the same in both of them. They're basic principles that were being taught by Jesus here. Uh, the idea of first praying to Father, right? Both of them address God as Father. Uh, both acknowledge the hallowed be your name, the idea that you are holy God. The idea that your kingdom is coming and we want to going to be aligned with it. The idea of taking care of our needs. And by the way, that doesn't say wants. It says needs, right? Our daily bread. And then forgiving our sins as we forgive others. And then leading us not into temptation. It's funny that those are different occasions and all six of those elements were there. What I really think is more striking between the version that you read in Matthew and the one we're studying in Luke is what caused Jesus to teach it. In Matthew, in the middle of the Sermon on the Mount, he was actually giving it as a counterexample. He said, don't be like these Pharisees who pray in a way that's not genuine. Right? And, and this bothered him for a long time. Uh, in Luke chapter 18, uh, verse 9, here's something Jesus says. To some who are confident of their own righteousness and look down on everybody else, Jesus told this parable. Two men went up to the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. The Pharisee stood up and prayed about himself. And some, some versions actually suggest that he, the, the, the way the language would work, that you could imply that he prayed to himself. Why not? If you think you're righteous, why not? Right? Why, why not? Uh, well, because it's wrong, that's why. But he prays then this wonderful prayer, and I'm being sarcastic. God, I thank you that I'm not like other men robbers, evildoers, adulterers, or even like this tax collector over here. I fast twice a week, and I give a tenth of all I get. Now, does that sound like a prayer of humility? See, Jesus was sick of this stuff. This was showing off, right? By the way, going on, the example he gives in verse 13, but the tax collector stood at a distance. You do remember how hated tax collectors were? Even worse than they are now. How's that? Okay. Uh, he, he would not even look up to heaven, but he beat his breast and said, God, have mercy on me, a sinner. Ah, I tell you, Jesus, said, this man, rather than the other, went home justified before God. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, and everyone who humbles himself will be exhausted. This is what he was fighting. This is what the Sermon on the Mount was like. And just to, to show that, he leads into it. The few verses leading into that, he gives another example. In, uh, the, the, the Lord's Prayer in Matthew begins in verse 9. Listen to verses 5 through 8 as he kind of swerves into it. And when you pray, he says, don't be like the hypocrites. For they love to pray standing in the synagogues and on the street corners to be seen by men. I tell you the truth, they've received their reward in full. Like if, if you stand up in front of everybody and, and praise yourself for how much you've given, that's all the reward you get. Everybody that you wanted to hear it heard it. Right? That, that's it. Whoopee. But when you pray, he says, go into your room. Some say go into your closet. Right? Go into a quiet place. Go into your room. Close the door and pray to your father who is unseen. 
then your Father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. By the way, I, I can get as aggravated as you can when people try to take prayer out of things, but you, you want to tell me how you can actually stop somebody from praying? You think about that for a minute. I know that things I think were better when a teacher could actually lead a class in prayer. But I've given a lot of math tests. I see kids praying whether I lead it or not. <laughs> right? Seriously. Do you think there's anything that can stop you from praying at any time, at anywhere? So let's, let's remind ourselves as Christians, when we go into the throne room of God, in secret our Father sees and hears. Right? We can encourage kids to pray anywhere, anytime. Amen? Okay. That's a, my, I'll drain the swamp moment there. Uh, so, and when you pray, don't keep babbling like pagans, for they think they'll be heard because of their many words. Do not be like them, for your Father knows what you need before you ask Him. Isn't that beautiful? Luke's version is different, as we see in, in verse 1. This isn't so much like, don't be like these other goofballs over here. It's this, one day, Jesus was praying in a certain place. When he finished, one of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray, just as John taught his disciples. That's different, isn't it? That's something where someone was watching. We don't know which disciple this was, right? If it had said one of the apostles, we might think it was one of the 12. The word disciple means it could have been one of the 72. It could have been one of, who knows who this was, right? First of all, Jesus was praying in a certain place, and I get the impression that whoever asked him this question was watching, was watching and observing him. And I think that's interesting, right? They were maybe even listening in. Your kids ever caught you reading the Bible? Right? I mean, uh, ever caught you praying? Again, remember, to do this in a way that is showy so people can see is wrong. But a consistent part of your life, people will stumble into you praying from time to time. That's okay. That's just fine. In this case, somebody was watching Jesus pray, and it made a profound effect on them. Uh, my wife Donna is, is visiting her, her family in Iowa. I wish she was here today because she tells this story that's really amazing. In our neighborhood, when our daughter was about two years old, there was another family in our neighborhood. They also had a daughter who was two. And this lady's name is Kelly, and that's all I'm going to say. And Kelly, well, she had grown up a Roman Catholic, and she went to church every day. And at one point, she said, they came to our house all the time, right? When you, we play dates and things like that. They're in the neighborhood. Our, our, the, the girls got along. And at one point, she said, you know, I noticed something. She said to Donna, when you and Bill pray, it sounds different than anybody I've ever heard pray before. C can you relate to that? Now, I take no credit for that. I was probably praying like Charlton Heston back then, you know. <laughs> Dear God in heaven, you know, I was, I'm sure my wife gets more credit for this, and she deserves it. But do you understand, just even in this fallen place, this woman observed that it sounded different because there was a relationship, right? Can you imagine what it would have looked and sounded like to hear Jesus pray to his father? It would have been an unbelievable you, you, you it has to have been the most attractive and wonderful and maybe weird and strange thing you'd ever seen. And that's what one of his disciples saw. And with that in mind, you know, I, I think that's, that's what this guy is asking. Hey, will you teach us to do that? <laughs> and this is where Luke's progression from where he's gone in chapter 10 to where we are now makes sense. Because last week we heard this beautiful story of Mary and Martha. And the title of Kyle's message was First Things First, right? Because the most important thing about you is your relationship with Jesus. In the end, ultimately, nothing else about you matters other than your relationship with Jesus. And Jesus just taught this with Mary and Martha. Martha's complaining because Mary's not helping, but she's sitting at Jesus' feet soaking in that relationship. And Jesus says, you know, Martha, you're worried about so many things, but there's only one, right? That's important. And what is that one thing? Your relationship with Jesus. And so after that teaching, doesn't it make sense that he'd say, and here's, here's how you grow that relationship. Here's how you do that. 
And that's part of what we're going to learn in the Lord's Prayer. A lot of it's by prayer. Right? You know, I hear this disciple saying it. If I were writing my own version of the Bible, and I have no intention of doing it, but if, if I were trying to paraphrase this, I'd hear him say, Lord, I, I've, I've heard you talk about our need for a relationship with you, it, how, how important that is. That it's, it's actually it, it's primacy, right? And I've seen the relationship you have with God. It's weird. It's wonderful. I've never been taught or seen anything like it. It's, it's radical, though. John the Baptist is the only other person I can think of that ever spoke of it like that. Can, can you teach me how to do that? And that's the way I want you to hear verse 1. That's the way I believe it was intended. And that's, isn't that the heartfelt desire of every disciple of Jesus Christ? How do I have a more intimate relationship with Jesus? Since that's the only thing that matters about me, how do I grow that relationship? <laughs> That's what we're going to be talking about. Well, after we answer the question, who is Jesus? And we come to believe in him. We then embark on this journey to strengthen the knowledge of that relationship. Right? And we call it discipleship. That's what we call that. You know, so we, here at Highland Country, we want everyone to be a believer in Jesus. I can't make you do that, but I want that for all of you. And then after that, I want you all to be continuing to grow in your relationship with the Lord, right? That's it. And I'm not sure that we separate those. It's not like there's a phase A, and then six months later, there's a phase B. I think they both begin at the same time. I think that's interesting. Now, this part of discipleship, when you grow that relationship, it won't always be fun. Jesus was preparing us for that. Luke was preparing it for that. He said, man, this will be hard. You may have to give up some things. I'll put it to you this way. As you grow closer in relationship and walk closer and closer to a holy, holy God, guess what you're going to sense? Your own unholiness. And that will be uncomfortable. Right? As you move closer to a holy God, you're going to start realizing it's almost like maybe... I think I smell bad, right? Or like some people that, you know, you, you, that feeling you have when you've got the flu and someone comes to visit and you're like, man, just stay away from me. I'm contagious. I'm sick. This, this awareness you have of your own condition happens as you get closer and closer to a holy God. And so sometimes that can be unpleasant. But there's also a joy that comes with that intimate relationship, a joy that comes from knowing that you're resolving those things and you're deepening that relationship. So it, it should change you, but it should also bring visible joy to people, right? Jesus, I can tell you that on the authority of God's word, and Jesus taught it himself. When the 72 disciples went out, Jesus was promising them all these terrible things that will happen to them. And I believe when they came back that each of them experienced every one of those hardships and privations. And yet, they were filled with joy because their relationship and their serving the Lord. <laughs> Isn't that amazing? I... Uh, at the school we, where I serve, we teach Latin starting in the third grade. I hesitated to admit that to you because it sounds like, I think it might be cruel to children, it sounds like, but you know, here's the thing. They love it. They love learning Latin. I don't know why. But something happens as they grow older, right? The third, the fourth, the fifth, the sixth graders, they love it. Somewhere 7th or 8th or ninth grade, it becomes a little bit too much like a course, and they hate it. I don't mean they dislike it. I mean it's a visceral hatred. It's like, it, that's why when I bring up Latin that we teach it to third graders, a lot of people go, oh, right? No, but they love it at that. So we were wondering why that was. Can we do something about it? They love this. How are we... What are we doing wrong? What are, is it them? Is what? So we actually brought in the lady that wrote the book. I mean, there's a book on teaching Latin in Christian schools. We, we flew her in to observe our school, to watch us, to talk to us. This is amazing. By the way, this was 10 years ago, and since then, this, this lady has gone to glory. What a sweet saint she was. She said something that almost knocked me over. She said, Latin, 
when it's taught well in the hands of a gifted teacher is beautiful. If your kids are hating it, you're teaching it wrong. And I just went, we're teaching it wrong. And I think you can apply that to a lot of subjects, right? There's an awful lot of truth and beauty. Look, if you're teaching the Bible in the way that people hate it, I don't understand that. This is the most beautiful, awesome, engaging story in human history. The creator of the universe wants to have a relationship with you, and he's told you all about himself and how he can do that. If you bore people with that, you're teaching it wrong. If your relationship with Jesus makes you sour and dire like Eeyore the donkey, well, it does with some people. It should change you. It, there's serious moments about it, but if, it, if there's no joy in it, on the authority of God's word, you're doing it wrong. Amen? And this is what Jesus wants to tell us. So in his answer, listen to what he says. Verse 2, he said to them, when you pray, say, Father, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come. Now, the hallowed be your name that's the acknowledgement of how holy and other and set apart God is. That's that holy God that as we approach him, we sense that we are different and we know we have to change. We know that and, and he changes us. The idea of your kingdom come is an acknowledgement that is his universe, not mine. And that's what, by the way, that's one of the biggest acknowledgements a human being has to make. This world is not about me. It's about God and I get to be in it, right? Once you adjust to that attitude, it's your kingdom come. Let's bring your will about in this story. But don't miss the first word. The first word that you say in that prayer, Father. And this was a radical idea 2,000 years ago. It was so radical that they, they, this is one of the reasons that they killed him. I want you to read John chapter 5 for a minute, verse 18. For this reason, the Jews tried all the harder to kill him. Not only was he breaking the Sabbath, but he was even calling God his own father, making himself equal to God. This got Jesus in a lot of hot water, calling God father, right? Now he's teaching you and me to do it. Something's wrong with that. Well, let me tell you, it gets worse. Because the term for father is actually this word, this Aramaic word, Abba. And the best translation for it is dad, <laughs> daddy. It's like, it's like the babblings of an infant, it's Abba, Abba. And it still survives to this day. And if you think that's too familiar, listen to Romans 8 for a minute. For you did not receive a spirit that makes you a slave again to fear, but you received the spirit of sonship, and by him we cry, Dad! Father! Is that amazing or what? Do you remind yourself of that every now and then? You should. Galatians says the same thing. Galatians 4, 6, and 7. Because you are sons, God sent you the spirit of his son into our hearts, the spirit who calls out, Abba, Father. <laughs> so you are no longer a slave, but a son, and since you're a son, God has made you an heir. So the news gets even more radical. See, God is aloof to the Pharisees. They're not filled with the Holy Spirit. They don't have any relationship with God. They don't know that you can. Jesus says, oh yeah, you can. Not only can you have a relationship with him, you could be a son. Not only could be a son, you could be an heir. And that's just you, people falling over at that point. Because that's radical. And it's radical now. Even now, if you've ever had a sincere conversation with an, an honest, open person of the Muslim faith, ask them what their relationship is with Allah. And they will honestly tell you that you don't have a relationship with Allah. Allah is so holy and so far away from us that he, we just hope he leaves us alone. Right? Really? That's, that's strange. See, Jesus teaches that we, are, we can be God's children. Okay, I want you to have this image real clear in your mind because I want it to affect your prayer life. 
I want it to affect how you go into the throne room of God, how you petition the Lord boldly, like we heard in the other parts of this chapter, and how you see how God is your father. What father wouldn't give you the Holy Spirit if you ask? Take a look at this picture for a second. I know some of you are so young, you don't know that this is John Fitzgerald Kennedy, right? Uh, the president of the United States. This would have been in the 1960s. This is the most powerful man in the world. Uh, then and now, in the United States of America was the most powerful nation on earth. He is in the Oval Office, and if you or I tried to get in there, we'd be stopped just feet from the street. Wouldn't we? Just think about someone. By the way, once in a while people try, usually in order to get a free ticket into a mental hospital, right? Someone hops the fence or something, right? I, I, by the way, there's better ways to do that. If that's what you need, I can help. But, but the, somebody usually does that. And, and there's no way. You can't get in there. That's the most heavily secured, guarded place inside the Oval Office. And down there, do you see down underneath the desk? That's John John. John Fitzgerald Kennedy Jr. Now, why does he get to be there? And there's only one answer. Because of his relationship with that man. There's no other reason. Nobody else's kid gets to play under that desk. You and I don't get to go anywhere near that office. Leave this up for me if you would, Kara, for just a minute. Because now I need you to understand, why on earth would you be allowed to enter the throne room of God? And there's only one answer. It's not because you're holy. None of us are, me included. Right? It's not because we're worthy. I assure you, none of us are. We're all patients in that same hospital. None of us can demand to go in for some right of justice or anything like that. Job tried that. Doesn't work. We get to go into the throne room of God by just praying anywhere we want because that's our Father, because of the relationship we have with God or the relationship we can have with God. Amen? Isn't that a powerful thing to remind yourself about yourself as a child of God? Isn't it? That's a good thing to remember once in a while. Keep this image in your mind this week. As you strengthen your relationship with Jesus, go into that throne room. Be as familiar as you want with the king of the universe, knowing that he is also holy. You know, sometimes we think we have to balance those two. No, both up to volume knob 10. God is infinitely holy, and he... What limit does this young boy have on the relationship with his dad? None. None. And this is the way we should do this. Hebrews 4.16 says, Let us approach the throne of grace with confidence so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. That's it. You're a child. You get access to the king of the universe. It's something angels and other created beings are astounded by. Let's not take that for granted either. Okay? That's stunning to me. I guess uh, a final thought. I guess I should ask the team to come up here so they've got some warning here if I pray fast. Um, a final thought about this. Um, there are those today that talk about the, the they, want, they want to try and do their best to bring about peace on earth, and they appeal to this thing called the brotherhood of man. But it, it makes no sense that we could ever have any kind of brotherhood without acknowledging the fatherhood of God. And, and my heart aches for lost people that do not have this kind of access to God. To whom do they pray? What is their hope? I, I, I'm saddened for them, and I hope you are too, enough to be motivated to bring them, to encourage them. No, please, the God of the universe has created all of this, and he wants you to have that relationship with him. And once you've crossed that line, he wants that relationship to grow with you. And it's something you can work at every day. No one can stop you. 
Like the, the song I think we're about to sing, I think. Uh, the second verse of it says, I've seen many searching for answers far and wide, but I know we're all searching for answers only you provide because you know just what we need before we say a word. Let's pray. Abba, Father, Dad, we're so grateful that you have made us your children by your grace, not because we're deserving, but by your grace. So draw us now near to you. As we leave this place, as we devote ourselves this week, giving us a thirst, Father, and a desire to grow our relationship with you, to be closer with you every day, and to learn how to do that from others. Father, to those who do not know you, we ache to help them. Help the joy that fills our heart be a beacon to others so that we can be an advertisement, a walking trophy that reminds people of the relationship that they can have with you and that the whole world will know that you are God. And it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen.